Hey everybody, now that this series is done, I wanted to compile all the stories into one video for you, just out of convenience, so if you'd like to listen to the full story, you don't have to load four individual videos. So you may notice some differences in between the tracks, since I made them at different times. But with that said, enjoy Something is Pretending to Be My Friend by Spartan School. Last summer, I started working at a summer camp. And it's your standard summer camp. And there's a cabin for the boys, a cabin for the girls. They were around 10 or 13 years old. A cabin for the counselors and a separate building that works as an office slash medical slash house for the two adults that run the show. The counselor cabin is larger than the others and has two rooms that face each other across a recreation slash living space. It has a pool table and an old TV with an SNES hooked up to it. And it's a pretty chill way to spend the summer. And there were five counselors at any given time. Each room was designated and shared by gender. My first summer there was awesome. I met some really cool people and the kids were great and it was a blast. I was one of three male counselors and the other two were girls, your typical cute camp girls. We would spend our afternoons in the sun, swimming or hiking, and the nights shooting pool and clearing Mario Bros. While we were all really good friends, David and I really hit it off. We liked the same bands, had the same interests, and the whole nine yards. And it was nice to have someone I considered a real friend out there. Camp ends too quickly, though. The end of the summer was coming, and we knew we would have to part ways. I added everyone that I worked with on Facebook the second I got home. The only internet access in the camp was an old computer in the office. We planned to have a group chat where we would keep in touch. I kept in contact with the four others, especially David. We added each other on Xbox and would game together late into the night. A few months into the school year, and the group was drifting apart. It wasn't really anyone's fault, but living on different sides of the province was starting to take its toll. We were spending time with our school friends, and I didn't blame anyone. I would still have David regularly, but our conversations grew further and further apart. Early the next year, David and I's favorite band was playing at a show in Toronto, where I lived. I messaged him on Facebook about the event, and he was thrilled, ensuring me that he would drive down. I told him he could stay at my place, and it was settled. I was really excited to see him again. A couple other people at my school liked this band, but no one that I would consider a good friend. It would be nice to watch them rock out with someone who got it. The day of the concert rolls around, and David messages me that he's running late and will meet me at the hall. No big deal. I head to the show and wait outside for him. He showed up right before the band was going to go on. He was stoned out of his mind. And I shrugged it off. Getting baked at a concert is hardly uncommon. Also, I didn't want to seem like a buzzkill. It did make me wonder how well I really knew David. The concert was a blast. I got so sweaty in the mosh pit that I looked like I'd been swimming. And just awesome punk music and hanging out with a good buddy. I suggested that we head home when the show had ended. David shook his head and insisted that he wanted to stay out and party some more. He'd been talking to some girls and reluctantly I agreed. We had a pretty good time rolling around the nearby parks, smoking and drinking from a flask one of the girls had brought. I was getting a little buzzed when David pulled a baggie of mushrooms from his pocket. For whatever reason, the sight sobered me up pretty quick. I took him aside and said that we had been out late enough and I wasn't really down to do shrooms. David laughed it off and basically told me to head home and if he couldn't find a warm place to sleep, he looked sideways at the girls as he said this. He would call my cell. If it came to it, he could sleep in his car. I didn't want to leave my friend, but I really didn't want the night to get out of hand. I sighed told him to message me if he needed, and bro-hugged him goodbye. After taking the brunette's phone number, I jogged home. We had wandered near enough to my house. The next day, I woke up fully clothed and hungover. 
I didn't think I had too much, but my body had other ideas. I ran to the toilet to yak and suddenly remembered that David had been out all night. The only message on my phone said something like, Hey man, you'll never believe me, but I hooked up with both those girls. What a great night. Anyway, thanks for having me out, man. I won't see you again till summer. I need to drive straight home. I forgot I'd work this morning. I thought it was weird that he had come and gone in such a flurry, but his house was at least a four-hour drive away, so leaving early for work made sense. After the concert, David and I grew closer again, for a few weeks before the inevitable drift. It's funny how being geographically far apart can make friendships diminish. It wasn't like I didn't like him anymore, just that with girls and exams coming up, I needed to keep my focus homebound. Before I knew it, I was applying for another year of summer camp. I hadn't spoken to David in well over a month. Before I left, I shot him a quick message on Facebook. Hey dude, camp starts soon. Hoping to see you there again this year. Something casual. I saw that he viewed the message, but after five minutes of last minute packing, he had not responded. So I shrugged it off and threw my phone in my bag. It was a long drive, having only one vehicle. My parents planned to drop me off and pick me up when camp ended a month later. I was thrilled to be out of the big smoke and into the crisp air of Algonquin Park, which for those of you who don't know is a very large forest park in northern Ontario. The counselors always get to camp a day before the kids so we can get set up and organized. I was one of the last ones there. I introduced myself to Jane, Sam, and Abigail, who preferred Abby. They seemed very run-of-the-mill for camp counselors, but I was excited to meet new people, especially girls. David was nowhere to be seen. We piled into the office building, and the two other gentlemen instructed us on our duties and responsibilities. There were the first aid kit, the curfew for campers, things like that. This was the girls' first year, so I was considered somewhat of a senior and had to answer many of rhetorical and theoretical question they asked. As they droned on on what to do in a case a camper goes missing, my mind wandered to David. Was he even going to show up this year? As much as I liked the idea of being alone with three girls all month, I would have liked to have my friend there. I turned my head to glance out the window and smiled as I saw David approaching the building. I didn't think about it until later, but the window was on the side of the building that faced towards the heart of the forest opposite the side of the road and parking lot. David came in and apologized for being late. The supervisor seemed not to mind because he was also in his second year of camp and knew the rundown. After the meeting, the counselors quickly set about getting everything ready. We encouraged the newcomers to rush through the duties so we would have the evening to relax and get to know one another. The lad on one of the boys' cabins was giving us some difficulties. So I was inside replacing it when David and I first got a chance to talk properly. He wandered into the cabin, whistling a tune. Nabby's pretty cute, huh? The standard David. I laughed, and we got to chatting and catching up. I've been rambling for a while, but I think those details were important. Last night, it was when things started to get very weird. I was in bed, following a night of destroying David in Super Mario Kart. I must have been sleeping for at least a few hours when something woke me up. In a groggy state, I glanced at the clock. 3.44, I grumbled to myself and rolled over in bed. The room I was splitting with David was fairly large, with opposite bunk beds on each side. But from where I was, I could clearly see David was not sleeping in the room. In fact, it looked like he had not even touched the blankets. I tried to remember how events right before bed had unfolded, but... I was drawing a blank. The long day of travel, work, and gaming had taken its toll, and I just flopped onto bed and crashed. Knowing something was off, I started to shake off the sleepiness. I slowly sat up and reached towards the lamp on the bedside table. As I grabbed the chain, I heard a dull thumping sound outside of the cabin. My bed was against the wall that faced towards the clearing of the center of camp. There's a window that looks out that way further down along the wall, but from the angle in bed, I couldn't see through it. My heart started racing, but my hand would not pull the chain. In my head, I thought through the possibilities. Bear? Moose? Deer? Mountain lion? One of the supervisors? It could be anything. 
The animals weren't a threat as long as I was in the cabin. What made the lump in my throat was that David wasn't in his bed. I felt responsible for him in the way that friends do, and I knew I had to look out the window and make sure everything was okay. I slid from under the cover slowly, trying very hard not to make any noise. My bare feet rested on the ice-cold floorboards. My body was now in full alert mode. I slowly and stealthily made my way towards the window, performing some sort of golem-esque movement as I went. As I moved along the wall, my angle at the window improved, and the campsite was coming into vision slowly. I got to a point where I could see about half of what the window showed and still couldn't see anything. It gets dark out here, but we have fairly large security lights that go on at night, no brighter than a street light. My eyes were adjusting to the scene when something came flying from the right side of the window into my line of sight. I instinctively flung myself against the wall. At this point, it probably would have been best if I just crawled back to bed and hid, but of course I didn't. Who does the rational and sensible thing in these situations? Besides, the mystery was too much. I slid along the wall and crouched under the window. Slowly, I rose my head to get a peek over the bottom edge, and I saw what was causing the noise. It was David, and he was dancing. I'm not talking disco. He was flinging himself to and fro, leaping into the air, spinning around and flailing his arms, really putting on a show, and I also noticed that he was completely naked. My heart still frantically beating, I wasn't sure what to do. This shit was weird. They didn't train me to deal with my roommate going crazy and dancing in the night. I glanced back around the room and saw David's bag open and the floor near his bed. Something in my head clicked. David must have brought along some of those mushrooms and was having a wild trip. Not the end of the world, but still dangerous to use stuff like that in the wilderness. If he got lost, he might never be found. I started rising more and more in the window as I contemplated the alien scene. A lot happened very quickly. And the first thing I noticed was the smell. It flooded into the room and nearly suffocated me with its intensity. It smelled like copper. Thick, old copper. I knew enough to know the smell of blood, and, and I had to fight back the urge to vomit. And the second thing that happened was the moonlight coming from the clouds to illuminate the clearing in the pale light. David had stopped dancing, facing the forest, and his chest was heaving up and down heavily. At this point, I was standing completely upright in the window, transfixed with the scene in front of me. David began walking towards the forest, and I felt a cold dread start to creep through the floorboards into my legs and my chest. He took each step with precision and purpose. Ten paces from the forest, he stopped and stood for a while. The panic was settling in fully now, and I was barely breathing. The cold had spread through my body. The smell had gotten worse and worse with every second. My brain must have realized I was suffocating because I suddenly took a sharp breath. <laughs> it had barely made a noise, but I instinctively knew it was too much and that he had heard me. I saw David snap his head around and look directly at me. I dropped to the floor and frantically crawled back to my bed. I kept telling myself that he shouldn't have been able to see me. It was too dark in the room and too bright outside. I started to cry as my eyes darted back and forth between the door and the window. Hours went by, with nothing happening, but I was definitely too afraid to go look out the window again. Eventually, I fell asleep. I don't know how. When I woke up, it was with a start. Fearing for my safety, my eyes immediately flew to David's bed. He was sound asleep and snoring. I almost laughed when I realized that I must have dreamt the whole thing. I asked the girls later that day if they had noticed anything weird during the night, just to be sure, but they only mentioned that it seemed very cold. I was beyond rattled, but I managed to convince myself that it must have been a very brutal nightmare. David seemed completely like himself. Some part of my brain refused to mention the dream to anyone. The other counselors could tell I was bothered, 
So I said the camp food had given me an upset stomach. They laughed at this and it didn't pester me further. Later that day, campers were starting to arrive, which is a busy ordeal. We had to learn names and meet parents, make sure the kids had everything they needed, basically just boring work stuff. There were about 20 campers in all. I was sent to the office to input the names of the kids who had shown up and make sure the payments had gone through. I typed away on a spreadsheet for a few minutes, but eventually, being a 17-year-old, got bored and curious about what was going on with my friends back home. I booted up the internet browser and logged into Facebook. Looking over my shoulder at the door to make sure no one would catch me slacking, I had a few messages, but one stood out that made my heart drop into my stomach and my eyes shake. David. Hey man, sorry for the late response. I won't be at camp this year. My parents are taking me to Italy. Have fun without me. Let me know if I miss out on any cute girls. Not sure what to do and beginning to panic. I quickly Googled some details from last night and it led me here. I'm posting because I think it might be my best bet on finding out what the hell is going on. A lot of you seem to know about paranormal things. I'll make sure I check back tonight. I can come up with a good enough excuse to need the computer. I know I should just up and leave, but I'm afraid. So much has happened since the last post. I'm not sure where to start. First off, thank you for all your comments. As messed up as it sounds, having a name for this helps. Knowing that other people have encountered them and survived to tell the story helps. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I'm terrified. But you all give me hope. I wanted to believe that this was not something supernatural. But over the course of the next day, things changed. Sometimes I can be cowardly, but after I got it all out and hit submit yesterday, it gave me a small amount of peace. This peace allowed me to think clearly for a while, which allowed me to take action. The first thing I did was send an email to my parents, insisting that I needed to be picked up. I told them I felt like my life was at risk, and it absolutely was not a prank or me overreacting. They haven't replied at the time of sending this, but I know they will before the weekend. Next, I popped my head out and called in a supervisor. Now, I want to veer from the narrative for a moment and share that as soon as I realized that David was not David, I could feel deep in my bones that if he were to find out I knew, it would go very, very wrong for me very quickly. I resolved to take extreme care around him, avoiding him where I could, but not making it obvious that I was onto it. At this point, Nothing had happened that caused me actual harm, and I didn't want to pull the trigger on myself. The supervisor, Paul, entered the room. What's up? Computer problems? Paul was a nice guy. I liked him, and he liked me. I told him that my grandma was very ill, and the doctors thought she might only make it a few days. I pleaded that I be allowed access to the computer several times a day, on breaks, to check my email. I also told him that my parents might need to come get me soon. I feel bad about the lie now, but at the time it seemed like the best thing to do. Like I said, Paul was a nice guy. I had his full support. It was early in the afternoon still at this point. We had heard a large vehicle pulling up outside. It was a tall, wide man who clearly came from one of the nearby native reservations. There were a fair amount of native, aboriginal people in the area. Each summer, the camp took an excursion with the campers to the nearest one to learn a bit about the history of the tribe and all that. The parents liked that the kids had to do some learning. I hadn't been on one of the excursions last year. I hadn't been on the excursion last year, and it was David's responsibility. So this Aboriginal guy shows up, and a few campers approach him to talk, but he pushed through the small crowd, making a beeline for Paul and I. He shakes Paul's hand and glances at me, looking uncomfortable. The man had deep bags under his eyes. He said that he would feel more comfortable speaking in private. I didn't have much chance to consider it because at that moment, I noticed the pretend David was nowhere to be seen. Planning on asking where he'd gone, I thought it prudent to keep tabs on the 
possibly life-threatening monster. I approached Abigail. She started the conversation. Hey, I was just looking for your David. And we're supposed to take half the kids and do a preliminary hike along the main trail. I remembered this from last year. On the first day, we took the kids in a separate on the first day, we took the kids in separate groups around the nearby area, so that if they wandered or got lost from the camp, it might be easier for them to find their way home. It wasn't a long hike, but it went fairly deep into the forest. I saw David exit our cabin across the clearing and felt the cold fear gripping me. I panicked, and without saying anything, whipped around and started marching towards the trailhead. All right then, come on everybody, Abby shouted as her and ten campers followed me. I knew that going into the forest was a bad idea. I swear I'm not that stupid, but my fear of David overcame my fear of whatever else might be lurking and had gotten myself stuck. Also, if I turned back now, it might alert the predator. We hiked a solid hour and were fairly deep in the woods. About half the round trip, when one of the boys pulled on my sleeve, I think Matt is missing, the kid said, so calmly. Kids are weird like that. Abby, overhearing, ran over. What do you mean you think he's missing? Where is he? We did a head count, and sure enough, Matt was missing. At this point, I wouldn't be lying if I told you I wanted to bolt back to camp, steal a truck, and hightail it home. I froze. Abby was saying something to me, but I couldn't hear her. The weight of the forest was crushing me. I felt completely isolated. I knew instinctively that David had taken a child. Whatever this monster was, it was beyond hurting people. Abby shook my shirt and I snapped out of it. She had pulled out a cross from under her shirt and it bounced around her chest as she told me her plan. You start looking. Stay on the trail. I'll lead them back and get help. She was a good counselor and leader. I managed to stammer out a few words about David, but she just shook her head, heaved a big sigh, and led the kids back the way we had came. My fear had left me alone in the forest with some kind of evil doppelganger on the loose. Fantastic. Since I'm updating you now, it's pretty clear that I made it out okay. A few minutes went by while I stood there, unsure of what to do. I decided that there was a major flaw in Abby's plan, mainly that it had left me out here alone. I started back along the trail, but something caught my eye on the lower portion of the trail. It was David. He was shouting Matt's name as if he was searching for him. I didn't think he could see me. I was up a fairly steep incline, and the trail doubled back on itself, meaning I was looking down on him from behind. He stopped mid-shout and turned to look the way he had came, waiting a few seconds, and set off again. When he resumed walking, he wasn't shouting, or meandering. He walked with intent and purpose, like I had seen him the night before. I had frozen again, but as he exited my sight, meaning he had reached where the trail doubled back, I snapped out of it. Managing the hill was a bit difficult, but I managed to squeeze my way behind a tree where I could watch the trail. It was far enough away that a normal person wouldn't have been able to detect me. Luckily, it seemed that the false David couldn't either. He kept walking with purpose past my position before turning a 90 degree angle straight off the trail. Remember when I wondered who does the responsible thing in these situations? Yep, you guessed it. I decided to follow David. I could feel something urging me to follow. I'm not sure if it was an innate curiosity or some other force, but there was a weight in my chest when I considered leaving the beast to his devices. Now, I'm a fairly experienced hiker for a city kid. Despite that, I could not keep up with David's pretender, not even close. Just when I thought I'd lost him, I came upon a scene that seemed like the strangest thing to me. I expected to find David covered in the blood of Matt. I expected to find him mid-feast. I expected to find him wearing some poor boy's skin as a fashion statement. What I didn't expect to find was a kind and nurturing David, wrapping a wound on the poor lost boy's arm before picking him up and whispering to him while gingerly carrying him back to the trail. I ducked behind a tree about 30 yards from the duo. My head was trying to piece it together. What is this thing? I waited a solid half hour before I went back myself. I was a little lost, but I knew the area and soon enough came upon a river that I knew and found my way back to camp. 
But as much as I can, as much as I was convinced that David was evil, exposing myself to the elements out in the middle of nowhere was much more dangerous. Also, this thing seemed to have some sort of incredible tracking skills, and I did not want to prompt the camp to send search for me. The thought of playing man tracker with some sort of hellish monster was unappealing to say the least. Everyone was cheering for David as I approached the camp. He was all smiles, and everyone was impressed with his story of how he had just felt something leading him to the lost boy. He turned and looked me dead in the eyes and said, Hey man, I thought I was going to have to come back and find you too. Welcome back. Suffice to say, I nearly shit myself at these words. This thing was toying with me. I knew it wanted me to question the situation even a little. It was begging me to tip it off that I was onto it. I wasn't going to play. I mumbled that the hike had worn me out, and even managed to half sick and smile. David looked me in the eyes for a few agonizing seconds before he smiled back. Get some rest, dude. I'll take your chores today. Wow, I thought. Uh, how nice for a demonic hellspawn. I ignored all the concerned looks from the campers and peers. I couldn't feel anything. I was horrified. Everything looked alien. Suddenly, I felt alarmed. Why was I so tired? I could feel my eyes dropping as I stumbled into a cabin. I looked at the clock as I lay in bed. 7 p.m. I blinked and the time changed. 3.39 a.m. My heart dropped. I'm running out of ways to describe the fear. It's like an icy hand is holding my heart, squeezing it. It's agony. It's, it gets better when the sun rises, but this is getting to me. My eyes were wide. I looked at David's bed, already knowing what I would see. It was empty. I heard the thumping sound. I smelled the blood. The moonlight shone through the window. Some ulterior force was pulling me again. I stood and made my way to the window. David was mid-dance again, but the scene was different. Matt, the missing and found camper, was standing in the spot ten paces from the forest. The same place David stood the night before. I was looking at his back. He was eerily calm and, and seemed unfazed by the naked man leaping and bounding around behind him. The bandage had come off his arm. The moon revealed an intricately designed wound. The blood was dripping down his arm to the floor. I stared on. I couldn't tear myself from the scene. As David finished his dance, I noticed the most horrifying thing yet. A tall, slender shadow loomed behind the trees on the edge of the forest directly in front of Matt. I could feel the force of the shadow beckoning to the boy. The next thing I know, it's early morning. The beginnings of sunlight are peeking through the window. David's in bed, snoring away. I silently left the room and made my way to the computer. I'm out of ideas. If I make it another day, I'll update you all. So much has happened since the last update, I'm just going to dive right in. After I sent the previous post, I decided to follow up on some advice a few people had left. I loaded up Facebook. My messages were empty. The previous message sat there, proof that whatever was parading around the campsite was not my friend. I decided to confirm this. I sent a message to the account. I wanted to sound innocent, like nothing weird was going on, in case the monster was the one monitoring it. I knew it liked to play games. My message basically said, Hey man, I hope you're having fun. In retrospect, it was stupid. If the pretend David was monitoring the page, it would easily figure out I was onto it. Also, I looked at his profile. There were no photos or updates dating after shortly before I left for camp. Unusual for a teenager, but I was basically praying at this point that David was out there and could maybe guess why this was happening and help. The monster took his form. I figured there might be a reason. I was doing all this snooping, and it distracted me. When I heard the truck coming into the campground, I snapped out of my daze. I was in the zone now. Being active gave me strength. I quickly logged out of the computer and ran outside. 
It was still early, so the campers and counselors were in bed. The native man climbed from his truck and approached me. Paul, the supervisor, came jogging out from the trailhead. He's the morning workout kind of guy, I guess. Hey, John, started Paul. You don't look well. Another attack? John sighed deeply and pinched his nose between his thumb and index finger. His voice was deep and quiet. It's the fifth one. We've lost more people this month than in the last decade. Something is wrong with the animals. People get attacked sometimes, but this is bad. You need to close the camp. Send these kids home. It isn't safe. I guess because I knew about David, I could feel the lie. Paul can get serious when he needs. He nodded his head and ran into the office to get the other supervisor. I was standing with John. He had turned and was resting his elbow on the hood of his truck. To his back, I whispered that I knew the truth, that it wasn't animals. His back tensed up. Finally, I had broken my silence about it. I got excited. I quickly spat out what I'd seen David do the previous two nights. My heart was racing. I felt afraid to be talking about it so near the monster, but I kept an eye on the counselor cabin as I spoke. John turned and looked at me solemnly. My heart sank as he spoke his reply. I have no idea what you're talking about. He trailed off partway through and looked over my shoulder, towards the cabin where David was sleeping. My gaze followed. David was there in the doorway. He was staring at us, but he looked different, pale, thin, and afraid. He wheeled around and slammed the door shut. I was frightened. Tension was building. I felt something was about to happen. I turned back as John grabbed my shirt. Your friend is gone. I saw its face. You people need to leave this place before it's too late. John flew into his truck and tore away. A few seconds later, I'm alone and shaking. The two supervisors came out of the office and were heading towards me, presumably to ask me where John was going. I heard the door to the counselor's cabin rip open. I turned to the side of David marching towards me in the same fashion he used in the woods and at night. Panic was setting in again. As I looked back and forth between David and the two supervisors, something caught my eye. Matt, the young boy that David had done something to, was staring at me through the boy's cabin window. This was the final thread. Something inside snapped and I finally did the responsible and reasonable thing. I turned and ran. We have a couple of trucks that are designated for camp use. They usually keep the keys inside. I didn't look back as I sprinted to the parking lot, hopped into a truck, and slammed the pedal down. After I rounded a few corners, my head started to clear. I had a decision to make. I could just leave everyone out here and drive home. I probably didn't have enough gas, but I could have made it pretty far. My other choice was to try to get help. I knew the police would call me crazy. Hell, I'm still not sure on that. I settled on going to the nearby native reserve. John obviously knew about what was happening, and I figured he was my best bet. As I turned in the general direction of the reserve, something in the forest caught my eye. It was dark, and moving quickly alongside the truck, I looked back at the road and saw a man standing in my path. At this point, I was certain I didn't care anymore. I was planning on hitting the damn person or thing, whatever it was. As I got near, I could feel the same ulterior force I had felt all through the madness, challenging me to pull the wheel to the side to avoid the man who I did not recognize. The next thing I knew, I had ripped the wheel to the side and was crashing through the brush. The truck wasn't the most beastly vehicle ever made, but it went a fair distance through some thick growth before it wrapped around a tree. The driving away from horrific things cliche stopped there. I wasn't desperately injured or stuck in any way. I was pretty far from camp at this point, far enough that David should not have been near me. I considered going up to the road, but remembering that something had driven me off, I decided it would be better to trust the woods. I had lots of daylight left, and so far nothing too crazy had happened during the day. Fear was still seeping into my mind, clouding my judgment. I was convinced that it was the end for me. I'm an experienced woodsman, and could barely keep up with David when he was stalking Matt. He would find me. I was so confused. What ran me off the road, and why? Were there others like David that were working together? I pondered the whole thing while making my way through the brush. Every sound I made 
agonized me, and everything I heard made my heart race. Paranoia and panic can be dangerous. I was so caught up in my thoughts that I nearly didn't notice that I had wandered into sight range of a small building in a clearing. I dropped to my stomach. One thing that was happening through all these trials was that my reactions were getting good. I was so on edge. I felt spread too thin. I heard nothing for a few minutes, so I slowly crept closer. It was a small wooden cabin in the middle of nowhere. Great. No way that can be bad, right? Never mind, I'm being haunted by some sort of doppelganger with a passion for interpretive dance and sacrificing children's souls. And slowly, I approached the building. Figuring at this point, I'm already on the knife edge. Why not push my luck a little further? I was at the rear of the building. It had plain, straight walls. No windows. I decided it would be best to circumnavigate the building in the woods and scout it out. Felt good to have an objective besides don't die. I saw nothing. Nothing was moving. There was no unusual sounds. The single door was open a crack. No locks. I was afraid as usual, but I felt the pulling sensation again. I stood and started walking towards the door. I pushed the door open. It swung inward. I was immediately assaulted with a horrid smell. Not blood this time. Rot. Death. I covered my nose and mouth with my shirt, biting back the urge to vomit. Slowly, I made my way into the room. The sunlight only lit a small section of the floor, but I noticed a chain hanging from the roof. The lights flickered on, revealing two things. The smell prepared me for the first sight. A corpse. Its hands were chained to the roof. It looked thin and decrepit. The lights caused a fleet of flies to launch from their meal and buzz around in droves. That nearly made me lose my mind. I can still hear them as I type this. The other thing I saw, I was not expecting. A small table with a laptop on it. I was pulled to the item. Something that if I had seen in a Starbucks back home, I wouldn't have even noticed it. Out here, it represented an alien and terrifying feeling. I pulled open the screen with shaking hands, not knowing what to expect, but unable to resist. The web page was open. It was Facebook. The profile had one unread message. It was from me. This was David's Facebook. I quickly realized the corpse sitting not five feet from me was my friend. He was gone. I couldn't fight it back anymore. The sick sprayed from my mouth onto the floor, splashing on my shoes. The vomit actually cleared my head slightly. I was still heaving, but I had a rare moment of clarity. First, I just made a lot more noise than I was comfortable with. The second, I left evidence that I'd been here. Whatever that monster was, it would know. I turned just in time for the door to be kicked open. A light blinded me. My stomach dropped and I froze. I've been looking for you. A familiar voice whispered as my eyes adjusted to the light. John stood in the doorway. He put a calm hand on my shoulder and led me out into the dusk. I felt like I was dreaming. I followed John willingly, not having any idea what he was doing here, or if he was involved in the dead body of my friend that sat in the cabin. I just couldn't contemplate things anymore. I had reached my limit. Exhaustion and fear can take a mean toll. He led me through the brush, quickly and quietly, only stopping occasionally to listen. Before I knew it, I was being helped into his truck and we were driving down the dirt road. I started speaking, but John silenced me with a reassuring tone. Not yet. I think I slept a bit, but the next thing I can remember is being pulled from the truck and brought into a warm house and sat in front of a computer. Keep telling the story. It's weakening them. I turned to look at the tired native man in the face. I started to cry, confused and afraid. He watched me cry for a few minutes before gripping me strongly by the face and explaining very calmly and seriously that I needed to share this. He said he was going to explain things as he knew them once I updated you. I don't know, but the running conversation here is helping. In some way, maybe we're getting closer to finding the truth. Keep it up, everyone. I feel safe for now, but I know the monster is out there looking for me. Wish me luck.
First things first. Sorry I couldn't update sooner. Things somehow managed to get worse since the last update. I know some of you are worried for my safety, and you would be completely justified in your thinking, since this is the last time I will be able to reach the world. I want to take my time. Let me start where I left off. I sent the update and stood from the computer. I could hear raised voices out in the hallway beyond the door. I couldn't understand them. Muffled as they were, typing out what had happened had once again helped me come to grips with my situation, as wild as it was. I had to figure this thing out. Or die. Pretty simple choice. I wasn't entirely sure if I could trust John at this point, even though he had every opportunity to take me out, if that was his plan, and still hadn't. I wasn't really sure on what the bigger picture was. How did John fit into this? I had been in an almost comatose state when he convinced me to send an update. What if that was a bad move? What if I was giving power to the evil instead of taking it away? I know I had too many questions and not enough answers. I could feel a rare moment of courage building as I thought through my situation. I snuck to the door and pressed my ear flat against it, trying to make out better what the argument was about. John was speaking sharply to a woman. Some things were still unclear through the thick door. I told you, if we want to, we need to do this. John sighed, almost as if he were resigning. Doesn't this make us just as bad? The woman's voice responded before someone stomped away and slammed the door. I could hear heavy footsteps getting closer to the room I was in. Something about the way the woman spoke put me on high alert. I suddenly became very aware that there were no windows in the room. Great, I had been trapped by another bad guy. I frantically looked around the room for an escape. I had become a bit of a master at that over the past few days. There weren't any promising prospects. The room was pretty basic. Something caught my eye, and I formulated a plan albeit a stupid, crazy plan. Up to this point, I had been dealing with supernatural forces. I, it had hardened me. The fact that something I assumed was a human was putting me in this situation filled me with hatred. John was a big guy, but he fell hard when he came through the door and caught the corner of the heavy computer monitor on his temple. He was dazed, but not out. I quickly jumped on top of him and slammed my hands repeatedly in his nose. Something inside had snapped. I could feel myself letting out a guttural growl as I continued to rain blows on John. I'll give credit where credit was due. John was pretty kick-ass. He was squirming under me and even managed to get a clawing hand to my throat before my final punch landed and he went soft and weak under me. As soon as that final hit fell, I remember the regret. It filled me deeply. I hated myself for doing this. I had started this summer job with so much joy and excitement. After only a few days, I had transformed into an animal. I'd nearly beaten a man twice my size to death with my bare hands. Fear can do incredible things to people. Still straddling John, I vomited to the side. This made me feel a bit better. I knew I had to keep my wits about me. I stood and looked out of the room and down the hallway each way. Apparently, the woman had gone far enough that she hadn't heard because she was nowhere to be seen. Next, I dragged John into the room, checking that he was still breathing, and closed the door behind us. I planned on getting my answers. When John came around, his hands were bound by his belt to the leg of the computer desk. It wasn't the most sturdy of tables, but he was in no shape to escape. I had found a long hunting knife on him, and sat with my back against the door as he looked up at me. I thought it looked pretty intimidating, but instead of crying and apologizing, John started to laugh. <sighs> so what's the plan? <clears throat> Kill the person who saved you? John coughed through the blood, still filling his mouth. I would need to learn some of this stoic bravery. It put me off, and somehow it had given him the upper hand. I told him I just wanted answers. The truth. I also told him I heard his wife... I was guessing at this point, and him arguing and knew he was up to something. That stopped his laughter. He grew solemn and seemed to shrink. You know nothing about the evil here. It will end us all. 
I was trying to protect my family. John was barking through broken teeth. He seemed to be telling the truth. I closed my eyes and sighed deeply. I had been through too much to give up. I was still horrified at what was going on around me. I never expected to be in this situation. Now that I had accepted it, however, I knew what needed to be done. John was given a choice. He could tell me everything, or I would go find his wife, drag her back to this room, and slaughter her in front of him. The native man's eyes grew wide at my words. The flight option had been closed on me too many times. The fight option seemed to be the only one left. I felt like a monster, but I knew what I had to do. John started talking. Can't remember what he said word for word, but here's the gist of it. Several months ago, a man had gone missing from the reserve. While this was definitely cause for worry, it wasn't exactly unexpected. And oftentimes, John's people would be gone into it for days, camping or fishing. The occasional animal attack had happened throughout the years. Something about this man was different, though. After the man and the family had been missing for about a week, someone knocked on his door. When no one answered, they opened the door. The man's wife and daughter had been violently slain and mutilated. John wouldn't go into details and left to rot in the house. This had caused a massive uproar in the community. The man had obviously murdered his wife and run off. The police were informed, and a search party was put out. They found the man's body about 20 miles away, in the middle of the forest. I guess that's why they didn't bother telling the local campers anything. Case closed, right? Obviously not. Anyway, fast forward a couple months, and the locals are whispering about monsters in the trees, saying that the murderer had cursed the land and brought a dark evil through his misdeeds. If you don't believe in the supernatural, it would sound like mumbo-jumbo, but anyway, somehow four people convinced themselves that there was a way to deal with the problem, and they set out into the forest to cleanse the area where the murderer had died. John was one of those people. When they got out into the middle of the forest, it was dark. They couldn't see to do their work, so they set a fire. Through the trees comes a man, the murderer. He isn't hostile. In fact, it's opposite. He sits among them and whispers kind, loving words, moving from one to the next, a smile on his face too wide to be human. As he passes, each person is marked with an intricate wound on their arm. They all bled together except for John. The man told John that his work was important and that he needed someone to keep in touch with their human side so that they could aid his new master. Something about this man was soothing. As John sat in the room, telling me all of this, he cursed the evil, and I could tell he regretted his actions, but he also made it very clear that at this time, there was nothing he could do. Like some ulterior force was guiding him. One of the four new recruits whispered to the murderer that he would like to meet his new master. John described a tall, powerful shadow that came silently. It came to the edge of the campfire and watched them. It was hideous and beautiful to behold. One by one, the people fell and worshipped the being, dancing around the fire and offering it blood from their arms. The spell cast on them was binding. John guessed the ritual wasn't as effective on him because he did not participate in the marking. After the ritual, the shadow vanished as though it had never been there, and each person felt a sadness. They loved the power of the master and regretted that it had left them. The murderer spoke up and provided them instructions on how to spread the power of evil over the land. John was told simply that fear and followers would empower the being. He was then released to return to the reserve and keep an eye on the people. The others were dispersed amongst the forest. When Paul, the supervisor, had emailed John about possibly having the camp visit for their annual trip, he came up with the plan to involve the children. 
His idea was simple. Capture a counselor and have them convert the children over time. If anyone grew suspicious of the activities around the camp, it would likely only garner more horror and thus grow the power of his master even more. John remembered David from the previous year. He was also easily able to find him thanks to Facebook. I grew hot in the face as David described how he had slowly introduced drugs to David through deception and manipulation, always staying in the shadows. He said it was almost too easy as he approached the boy, sleeping in his car in a shady Toronto parking lot. The shadow had taken joy in making a David-shaped monster. The murderer instructed John to let the boy die, slowly. John hesitated to agree, and the shadow grew, deep and dark and horrible. It let out a shriek. He knew that if he had failed his master, it would cost him everything. Now that the evil would have a steady supply of followers, John needed to create fear. He coaxed David into giving him his Facebook information through torture and messaged me from his account. Things went better than expected when I had posted on the internet about the horrors of the summer camp. Hundreds of people were all fearing for me and providing strength to the evil in the forest. John and the David monster had played me. They knew I would eventually run away in fear. It would help the others. They had forced me off the road. John had let me find my dead friend in the cabin, in the woods, and notify you all, all to help his master. I was crying as John told me all this. The fear, anguish, and rage came to a boiling point. I sobbed deeply, tearing at my hair and gnashing my teeth. I didn't hear John get loose. He hit me hard in the head and I rolled to the side. The weight of the heavy man was pressing on me before I knew what to do. But it had stopped moving. The hunting knife was hilt deep in John's abdomen. I had killed him. Fear once again took the helm and I leapt up, sprinted to the door and after looking both ways crept through the house. I came to an empty kitchen with a door leading to the outside. Still in a daze, I slipped out. I could feel something pulling me to the forest and I wasn't strong enough to resist. Something kept me going. I think I walked for days, but I can't be sure. Time had stopped being important. Eventually, I noticed that I was being followed by three tall, dark native people. My heart sank and suddenly I was aware of the danger. I took off deeper into the forest. It wasn't a surprise to me when I came upon the cabin where the body of my friend rested. I was clearly being corralled and led by the evil in the forest. I couldn't fight anymore. He opened the passage and I walked into the already lit cabin. The body of my dearest friend still lay in the corner. The laptop on the table was open, waiting for my final update. I felt the shadow rest a hand on my shoulder, and I cried for a while. The fake David had entered behind me and whispered soothing and loving words into my ear. I knew what my master wanted. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed this story, and if you'd like to hear any of the theme music that I've composed for it, I'll be uploading it on Reverb Nation. And be sure to check out the author's Reddit page for more stories, and their YouTube channel where they upload gaming videos. If you like my videos, be sure to like and subscribe so I can spend more time creating narrations and music for you. Have a good night.